And the next item of business is a motion on International Women's Day 2016. The business committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer will have 10 minutes to propose the motion and 10 minutes to wind. And all other speakers will have five minutes. Clerk, please read the motion. That this Assembly supports <coughs> the celebration of International Women's Day 2016 and Assembly Women's Week 2016, affirms its commitment to encouraging more women into politics and public life, acknowledges the importance of the work of the Speaker's Reference Group on a Gender Sensitive Assembly, and advocates the establishment of a Women's Parliamentary Caucus. And I call Karen McEvitt, who is the chairperson of the Speaker's uh, Reference Group on a Gender Sensitive Assembly. Karen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And it's my privilege to propose the all party motion uh, before us today, a day known globally as International Women's Day. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Business Committee for giving time to list this motion uh, and the timings of it today uh, to be heard earlier than usual. On the 9th of March 2015, the Assembly approved the Assembly and Executive Review Committee, or ERC, no, a report on women in politics and the Northern Ireland Assembly. The committee concluded that, under, the, that the underrepresentation of women in politics in Northern Ireland is a serious issue, which must be addressed as a matter of urgency. The committee made recommendations to the Assembly, the Executive and to political parties with the aim of addressing an underrepresentation of women in politics in Northern Ireland as a matter of urgency. Numerous submissions to the committee called for the establishment of a Women's Parliamentary Caucus. As an example of good practice in supporting existing female politicians and encouraging aspiring female politicians to enter politics, the Committee brought this recommendation forward, and I am pleased to inform you that the Assembly Women's Caucus will be officially launched today, the 8th of March 2016. International Women's Day and its first meeting was held uh, yesterday, the 7th of March. The key objectives of the Women's Caucus included the review and influence policy and legislation from a gender perspective, to increase the representation of women in the leadership of parliamentary committees, to build capacity and empower women through training women members on the Assembly the rules and procedures, to train women members in the procedures of and drafting of private members' bills, improve the leadership and parliamentary skills of its members by offering conflict resolution workshops leadership training programmes to empower women, to build confidence and to encourage them to be heard. The Women's Caucus will also work towards raising awareness around gender equality issues and gender sensitivity through the media, creating a social space for women and foster a sense of solidarity and to develop and maintain strong relationships among women MLAs and relevant bodies and organisations. The caucus will undoubtedly lobby decision makers, internal and external, on gender related issues, advocate gender equality on a local, national and international level, and network with relevant stakeholders and organisations to promote gender sensitivity. A political career path is deemed as not family friendly due to long plenary sessions and the varying demands placed on members' times. It remains true that women are main carers in our society, and as such we need to explore strategies to improve work-life balance and consider issues around childcare and other caring responsibilities. This will be another key priority for the Women's Caucus. One final objective for the Caucus will be to develop the development of a strategic plan for dealing with gender-sensitive sen issues and the promotion of gender mainstreaming within Northern Ireland Assembly. It was the ERC that recommended the establishment of a working group on gender sensitivity parliament and that this working group should have equal membership of male and female MLAs. If progress towards a gender sensitive assembly is to be achieved, it will continue to be important for the speaker's reference group to compromise both female and male members who can act as its champions in both the short and long term, i.e. the next mandate and who can bring a strategic perspective uh, to the work of the group. The Women's Caucus, however, will be an all-female caucus. I would like to acknowledge the Assembly's Commission's contribution to raising the profile of gender sensitivity issues and must also commend our committee and the Secretariat staff involved 
in the Women in Politics report and the researchers and raise who deepened the understanding of and the barriers uh, to the representation of women and gender equality issues. The Speaker's reference group on a gender sensitive assembly was established on the 10th of February 2016. And I would like to thank the Speaker for taking on such a proactive role on this matter and for establishing the reference group on a gender sensitive assembly. I would also like to thank my colleagues Sandra Overend, Paula Bradley, Katrina Rowan, Trevor Lunn and Stephen Agnew who sit on the group with me and each of them who have signed today's motion and are dedicated to increasing the level of females uh, across political and public life. The purpose of the Speaker's Reference Group is to support and advise on Assembly initiatives to enhance and support the engagement of women in politics, including the Women in Politics programme developed by Politics Plus, to provide the Speaker with advice on progress towards a gender sensitive parliament to prepare a three year gender sensitive Assembly action plan based on the recommendations from the ERC inquiry and the Inter Parliamentary <coughs> Union best practice and to support the establishment of a Women's Parliamentary Caucus, which it has now done. A lot of the work has been undertaken by Politics Plus to address the underrepresentation of women in political and public life. Politics Plus has been working to develop strong, sustainable international links, foster relationships between communities and across generations, and enhance the role of women in peace building and civic society through the successful delivery of Women in Politics Leadership Programme. Women in Public Life Programme, Young Females Leaders and Expert One Training is also included in this. While there is much work of the Women's Caucus to do, with the support of Pol Politics Plus and the Speaker's Reference Group, I should mention some positive equality changes that have occurred in political life, such as the position of the First Minister uh, for Northern Ireland here uh, is now held by Arling Foster, we also have seen the work of Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland, the leadership of the SNP, and the First Minister of Scotland, and of course Hillary Clinton fighting in the USA to be the Democratic candidate in the presidential race. And can I add uh, to that today, now that the decision has been made for uh, Marie Anderson for the Public Services Ombudsman, we're absolutely delighted that that post uh, will be taken up, uh, particularly on, a, on an important day like today. With more women taking up high prof profile positions, it is hoped that positive media coverage will help inspire more women to see politics as a career path suitable for them and I would highly recommend it to anybody. But we can sit back, we can't sit back and wait on uh, the societal changes. We must change our own society and it's my hope that the Women Caucus will drive these changes so that the male and female ratio of this assembly is much closer to 50-50 by 2020. Thank you Mr Speaker. Thank you and I call Ms Paula Bradley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I am delighted to stand in this chamber today uh, in support of this motion on this International Women's Day 2016. Uh, firstly, I'd say, like to say a few words of thanks uh, and take this opportunity. And the first person I want to thank is yourself. Um, I want to thank you for your commitment that you have had uh, at uh, Women in Politics and Women in Public Life. And I know a few months ago, uh, Katrina and Rowan and I ambushed you in your office and came up with one or two ideas that we thought might be good to look at for International Women's Day. But you took those ideas and not only did you make this assembly celebrate International Women's Day, you brought it into International Women's Week. So for that, I have to say on behalf of everyone I'm sure here, especially all of the women, we are extremely grateful you've put together a fantastic program, you and of course your staff as well. So thank you for your commitment uh, in bringing about what is a very special week and a very good week for us as women up in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, I'd also like to thank the Women's Lobby as well. Without the Women's Lobby, and their support and their help, I don't think we would be in the position that we're in today. I don't think we would have become as advanced, and we are advanced, we needn't kick ourselves too much. We have come a long way uh, since I first got elected in 2011 to where we are now. So I want to thank that women's lobby out there for their perseverance and for still for hammering on and banging that drum and saying that we as women deserve to have uh, more equality, and so I want to thank them for that. Um, just a, a, another thanks I want is the ARC committee. Um, as a lot of you will be aware, that uh, 
Katrina Rowan and I are the only two females that sit on that AARC committee. And I know when we brought up the issue of women in, in the Northern Ireland Assembly, there certainly was no gnashing of teeth, though I do think along the road at times I think some of the men wanted to throw their papers in the air. Uh, but none of them did. And what they did do was they supported us. They supported us 100% in what we wanted to achieve. We might not have got all that we wanted to achieve, but we certainly came some way. And it was through the ARC committee that we are where we are now, through their recommendations, and uh, uh, that we now have our speakers reference group and we now have uh, our caucus. Um, I think there are exciting times ahead for us all. And can I just personally thank Karen McEvitt and Sandra Overend as well um, for taking on the role <coughs> of, of chair and vice chair of the speakers reference group and, and looking at, at those issues around a more gender sensitive parliament because that was an issue that did arise uh, within our, our uh, ARC committee report. And when we look at a gender sensitive parliament, we look at many issues, but many of those issues that affect our gender also affect our male gender as well. Uh, issues around uh, our timings of our sittings and childcare and various issues. So we're not just here just to bang on the drum for, for those, those, those wives, mothers, daughters in this chamber. We're also there to assist in the equality for, for those fathers and sons and husbands as well. Um, so thank you to them for taking on that role. Um, I was pleased um, yesterday when we had our inaugural meeting of the Women's Caucus to put forward the name of Katrina Rowan as the chair of that. And uh, I will be supporting her. Some of, we, we have a very good working relationship. We're a bit of an unlikely pairing at times. Um, we disagree on lots and lots and lots of things. Uh, but there is one thing we do agree on, and that is, uh, is equality for women and a higher representation of women within this chamber. Uh, Mr Speaker, if I could just talk just a little bit. When I came here in 2011, I had already been a councillor and I had already been a mayor of a borough. But I came here and I remember delivering my first speech here in this chamber early on, and it was to do with domestic violence and violence against women. And I was like a rabbit in the headlights. I was, my knees were quaking. I was so nervous and so intimidated by this chamber, but it has been through the support that I have had from my party colleagues, from other people within this chamber, that I can stand here today and not feel like that rabbit in the headlights. You know, yes, I will indeed. Um, I just want to thank the member, first of all, for her comments um, and for uh, the tremendous work that she has done uh, and indeed her team in relation to gender equality. Um, and I wonder, would she agree with me on the importance of having women at every level, all different committees, and that it makes a significant difference for our women? I thank the member for her intervention, and I couldn't agree more. I think that we pay, play a very significant role in, as being legislators and making laws within this assembly, and I don't think that can be underestimated in any way. So just in, in, in closing, Mr Speaker, I would just like to say that being a member of this assembly has this helped me. It's helped me to achieve my goals. It's empowered me. It's helped me to unlock what potential I have. And I know there's much more potential ahead. You know, if you'd asked me that question four years ago, I might have given you a very different answer. But I am glad to say that I am a member of this assembly. And I hope that through being a member of this assembly, I've unlocked potential amongst women, whether they're young women or older women, and unlocked that potential to empower them to achieve what they want to achieve. And, uh, and just in finally closing, Mr. Speaker, can I wish everyone a very happy International Women's Day 2016. Here, here. And um, Lloyd or Noshunt and the man Honadiv. Happy International Women's Day to you all. And I'd like to join with uh, Paula Bradley and Karen McEvitt in congratulating the speaker on the tremendous International Women's Week programme. Today, uh, you'll be relieved to hear, rather than focusing on gender inequality in our society, I'm going to actually celebrate the achievements of women in this chamber um, and the major steps that we've taken in a very short period of time. Um, this time last year, 
we had the, this was the exact date that we debated the ERC report, the Assembly and Executive Review Committee report. And I, have to, I want to pay tribute to every single member of that committee, and I see that most of them are, are in the chamber here today. And really, I think that was the starting point of this journey. It was and a very important starting point. We lit the building up in purple for the first time ever. It was Judith Cochrane's uh, proposal, which we all supported. And um, we, we also went to um, Iceland, the ERC committee, where we actually saw some very tangible uh, things that could be done to bring about real changes. And that's something I know the Women's Caucus and I'm sure the Gender Sensitive Parliament, our working group, will, will um, continue to look at. For me, I have to say, probably the highlight of my time here was the trip to Sweden, where I really got to know for the first time ever on a personal basis a lot of the women from various parties. And we, I learned an awful lot there, but I also hope that we built real uh, friendships, at least I feel I built real friendships, while respecting all our differences. Since this time last year, we have created, or we're just about to we had the first meeting of the Women's Caucus. We've had about four meetings of the Gender Sensitive uh, Parliament. We have um, the Women's Caucus being launched tonight by um, Martin McGuinness and uh, Junior Minister Pengeli. And we have a range of other activities, including the granddaughter of one of the suffragettes on Friday, which I think Paula is officiating at, which, which is a fantastic way to end International Women's Week. We also have a First Minister who's a woman, we have two junior ministers, we have a Minister for Agriculture and a Minister for uh, Arts, Culture and, or Culture, Arts and Leisure. We have an Assembly Commission where for the first time ever it's three all, which I have to say makes it a much nicer place to be in. We have two women whips, I used to be in the lonely place of being the only woman whip, we now have two women whips. So that didn't happen by accident, that happened because women were taking power and also being supported by men in parties who understood the importance of true equality within each of our parties. It doesn't mean, as Paula, said, Paula Bradley said, that um, we all agree with each other. We don't. We all disagree on loads of different occasions. Yesterday, Paula Bradley and I were on two different sides of voting on an amendment, and straight after that we supported each other in the Women's Caucus. The trick is how we manage our differences. I have to say I enjoyed working very much with all of you. The fact that there were more women in different committees made them much nicer places to be in. I also want to personally thank my own colleague Raymond McCartney, the whip and group leader in our party, uh, do an awful lot of work together and I have to say he's just been a joy to work with over the last number of years and a really good party leader. Um, I'm really, uh, our group leader, I'm really um, conscious here today that as we have this debate, we're losing some very good women who aren't standing for election. We're losing Judith Cochran, we're losing Bronwyn McGahan, we're losing, we've lost Sue Ramsey, we've lost Michelle Gildrenew, uh, we're losing Anna Lowe. And really, I think the place is going to, this chamber, and this assembly is going to miss those women and what I want to do is pay tribute to them and wish them all the best. And I've no doubt we'd be seeing you up here again in whatever guise I will. <laughs> um, would the member agree with me that having women here, and you've, you've mentioned some of our high profile women as well, creates great model, role models for our next generation of female politicians? Absolutely. I, I do, and uh, thank you for the, your intervention. I absolutely agree with you. And that it struck me last night as we had an amazing event in the Long Gallery with some really powerful women and the participants, powerful women participants. There were over 90 uh, women and men there last night, and it was, it was a really, really uh, powerful event. And I'm really looking forward to the uh, events that are coming up. Um, and I'd just like to end on saying um, I lost my mother in December. And she was a good, strong woman who had a great life, reared seven children, and uh, really in different times she reared those children. And it's because of women like my mother and all our mothers who fought the good fight in their way, in their time. And I just want to 
as a mother now myself and as a mam or a grandmother, I just want to uh, put on record my thanks to her. Thank you. And I call Mr Trevor Lunn. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I'm sorry you caught me on the hop there. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased on International Women's Day as, as the, the first man and perhaps not the only man to speak in this debate today, but as a member of the, your reference group, I'm very pleased to do so. Um, and to speak in favour of the motion and in favour of increased female participation in public life and in favour of this Assembly recognising that we have a problem of unequal representation and that we have an obligation to do something about it. I commend your initiative, Mr Speaker, in setting up the reference group and I will contribute in any way I can to the work of that group, as I'm sure Stephen Agnew will as well, though he's not here today. Yeah. Can I just put on record my thanks um, to my colleague Trevor Lund for all the work that um, he has done as well in his role on ERC. And would he agree with me that men have as an important role um, as women in continuing to drive these changes through so that we see really able women um, being here playing a really important role in public life? The next minute. Yes, I, I thank my party colleague for that. Uh, and to put it bluntly, you won't make the progress you would like to make in this place without the support of men. That, that is a given. I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of other men who maybe don't need much persuasion will come on board with, with the initiative as time goes on. The, uh, the, the, the Women's Caucus will be indeed established today and uh, both groups can then drive forward an agenda which I hope will place women on a more equal footing in this place. And if we set the example, Mr Speaker, Others will follow, and the boards of public companies and the, those receiving support from public funds can be encouraged or persuaded or cajoled to um, do likewise. And the public appointments process should also be made to adopt a more equitable approach to their operation, and not, not just to women, frankly, but to minorities of all kinds, because it's something that's very lacking in their performance up to date. <coughs> Mr Speaker, your initiative, of course, has its roots in the ARC report on women in politics a year ago, one of the more significant reports I think that committee ever brought forward. And we produced almost 30 recommendations, two of which you have now acted on. And if they were all adopted, they would certainly go a long way towards achieving the results that we'd all like to see. And if I could just refer briefly to some of the recommendations. Um, recommendation one. Um, that political parties should consider developing targeted membership strategies to encourage more women. Yes, you see, should, should consider. Um, we, the committee recognised, number two, that high profile female MLAs can act as positive role models and that political parties should take us into account when making an appointments. Well, the, the point's been made. We, we now have six female ministers in this place, uh, which I think is, uh, is an excellent tribute to the fact that the Assembly is, is, is trying to do something. In particular, we have a First Minister, and uh, I, I welcome that appointment. I think it's, uh, it's a step, major step forward. Um, recommendation 7 is a recommendation that political parties may wish to consider the introduction of measures to increase the number of female candidates being put forward for election. Of course, that, that's really at, at the heart of it, Mr. Speaker. The, that it's whatever we do, whatever we can put in place by consensus across the chamber, it's still up to political parties to put people forward and to put women forward, not, not just in a tokenistic way, but to put them in a position of winnable seats. And that, that's the difference. Yes. For, for giving way. Um, I, like many others, in this chamber came through local government first, and when the member agree that that is where an emphasis should also be placed, um, the more um, candidates, female candidates that we can get into to local government will eventually lead to hopefully more candidates here as well. well yes, uh, that, that goes without saying. I'm talking about local government as well as, uh, as, as the Assembly, but uh, that is certainly the breeding ground for Assembly candidates of either gender, so I appreciate the point Mr Lyons makes. The um, recommendation 12, we should consider adopting measures from international best practice to create a gender sensitive Northern Ireland. Well, there's certainly, there's certainly a lot to learn from international best practice in this respect. And Ms. Rianne did mention the Icelandic experience, which was memorable, short, but very, very informative, I will say that. 
Um, the, um, oops, right. Yes, tw no, recommendation 22 is the last one I'll refer to. The assembly should ensure, where possible, gender representation be considered when agreeing official delegations from the assembly. And that would send a good message to whoever we're dealing with that this is a, an assembly that, that values equal representation as far as possible. So um, I'm absolutely in favour of that as well. <clears throat> but of course, Mr. Speaker, it, it is in terms of Stormont and local councils absolutely up to parties to put a fair proportion of women up for winnable seats. That's, that's the key to this. And for women, frankly, to assert themselves within parties, and uh, they, they appear to me to be perfectly capable of doing that, but it, it goes against the, the natural way of things in Northern Ireland. But it's, it's changing, and it's time it changed. That uh, the old notion that behind, behind every great man there's a woman is, is, is so out of date. <laughs> I shouldn't even be saying it, you know. So I, I also, I see my time is up, Mr. Speaker, I also celebrate International Women's Day. I wish all our women well on a good day, and I wish the Women's Caucus and the, the gender, uh, your own reference group, every success and the new mandate. Thank you. Mrs. Emma Pengelly. I rise to support the motion and uh, to celebrate women, their lives, hopes, ambitions and achievements on this International Women's Day. I welcome the opportunity to shine a light and celebrate the freedoms, rights and liberties that we enjoy in this Assembly, in Northern Ireland and across the world, while noting that more can be done here and much more must be done internationally. When I grew up in Northern Ireland in the 1980s and into my teens in the 1990s, I knew that there had been some challenges for women. However, like so many of my generation, I believed that the world was hurtling towards a point of gender equality and protection. I took that as an assumption that that would happen, within which we all had the space, regardless of our gender, to choose the opportunities and pathways that we wanted. I remember hearing about the suffragettes of how women used to have to leave the workplace when they got married, of archaic family law systems where the mother had no rights, or of how even a glimpse of an ankle was considered shocking. And as a child, these customs, laws and challenges seemed almost unimaginable. We had come so far. Yet, as a woman in my 30s, I look across the world and see what seems to be at times a regression in those rights and liberties and in the value of girls and women across the world. The statistics are stark. 27 countries still practice female genital mutilation, impacting on some 200 million young girls and women. Globally, one in three, one in three women will experience violence at the hands of a male partner. Globally, 30% of all violence against women starts during pregnancy. The majority of women killed across the world are murdered by a partner or close family member. And back closer to home, the England and Wales crime statistics show that one woman is killed every three days by a partner or former partner. I was shocked when I read that statistic. It's not something that we see on the news every night or every week. And even when, as a child or teenager, I did laugh at that idea of how shocking it would be to show an ankle back in the customs of 100 years ago, I had no idea that in 2016, women around the world would be publicly flogged and even killed for doing just that. The global developments have not just threatened peace and world stability, but also pose a huge threat to the liberties and rights of women. And it really struck me, speaking to some of the young women involved in some of the projects around uh, female empowerment, that they don't share that same expectation that I had in my teenage years in the 1990s, that they see the global threat to female liberty much more starkly now. We must stand united and fight against this rising tide of hate and misogyny internationally and prevent the further crushing of whole generations of women who have so much to give to medicine, art and literature, 
to the ideas and policies that will shape our world in governments, offices, in civil service and businesses and in politics. Maya Angelou, one of the uh, strongest women I think of recent times and somebody who I consider to be a, a role model, she said about strong women, you may encounter many defeats but you must not be defeated. In fact, it may be necessary to encounter those defeats so you can know who you are, what you can rise from, how you can still come out of it. There is indeed much to grieve when we look internationally, but I welcome the steps that the Assembly has taken uh, in terms of, of female participation and support. And I want us to take from today a revived sense of purpose in both securing and enhancing our liberty, liberties, participation and roles in life in Northern Ireland, while doing what we can to help and support women here, but also across the world. Thank you. I call Mr. Raymond McCartney. And so I imagine there in Tishbrack and Tabatak Shaw, August, I pay me towards Takayak Don Runshaw. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I am absolutely delighted uh, that both I and indeed the Assembly have had the opportunity this morning to mark International Women's Day. And we have seen uh, a number of events unfolding this week, particularly here in the Assembly. And I think it's, it's notable because there's been a very tight legislative schedule uh, uh, this week, but certainly the space has been made this morning to ensure that we highlight, acknowledge and validate the significant role that women have played in the promotion of rights, social justice, uh, be it across continents or indeed uh, down through the, the decades. And I think obviously this week there will be a particular focus played on the role of, of women, particularly here in the Assembly. And again, I want to acknowledge uh, the series of events which your office has obviously organised this week, obviously in close cooperation with a, a number of women, particularly the, the, the new focus groups that have been set up, and I think it's important that we continue on in, in that work. I, I know that th there will be a particular focus uh, uh, placed on the women MLAs who, who were elected since 1998, and I know this, I think tomorrow you're hosting a lunch for, for those and particularly uh, uh, former people. And I just want to acknowledge in particular Mary Nillis, who, who you would know well from the FOIL constituency and whom Maeve McLaughlin and I have worked closely with over, over many, many years. And Mary Nillis is an excellent example both of a, of a strong woman, strong personality, good public representative, and we've seen that you know, on a range of issues uh, before uh, and when it was difficult, when the political opinion, the political mainstream would, would have made it difficult for people to raise their voice, Mary Nilla certainly raised her voice in terms of raising the rights of women, uh, vulnerable people, tenants, uh, people in poverty, uh, prisoners, indeed anybody struggling to, to assert their rights. Mary Nilla was always there, and I think that she is an excellent role model for, for many, many people, and certainly I think she's a, an excellent representative both for women and MLAs. I will surely. Would, would the member allow me this opportunity and agree with me that following on that, you know, given it's International Women's Day and we've recently had Mother's Day, would the member agree with me that we should also remember those uh, women uh, in local government and indeed this assembly who are now deceased and uh, obviously the contribution that they give to local government and this assembly and, and other lives of, uh, and walks of lives through democracy that we should also be acknowledging and remembering them today? Gormalgut. Absolutely. And I've, uh, thank you very much, John uh, Cooler. And I've absolutely no doubt uh, that particularly this week, and I'm sure that the gallery and tomorrow in particular, uh, people will remember uh, those uh, people who have unfortunately passed away, be they you know, public representatives here in the Assembly, or indeed at local government, or indeed in each of our own political parties. A woman who were very strong, very forceful in ensuring that women's rights was always asserted, be, in a, be it within a party or right across the city. I, I want to welcome the, <coughs> particularly the initiative around the Women's Caucus, and, and I'm particularly pleased that, that, that it was one of the recommendations from the Assembly Executive Review Committee, of which I am a member. I, I think that in itself w was an excellent piece of work. Uh, I think it was a, a, a good foresight because I, I think a, a, at the beginning when the, the Executive Review Committee was set up, perhaps that wouldn't have been seen as one of the tasks 
that it would have been set. And I think, in particular, I want to thank Paula Bradley and Katrina Riam for proposing that. And then, certainly, uh, when we examined it, then we started to see many of the issues which need to be addressed and continue to be addressed. I think, in, in terms of the, the caucus itself, I think the strength, I think the, the people who are now in it are formidable representatives in their own right, but certainly when it comes to a certain uh, the, the rights of women in the Assembly to make this place a, a better place in terms of gender issues, and I have absolutely no doubt. Uh, last night, uh, on, a particular, on a different subject, was a, in relation to no under-representation in sport, w which I think is uh, something which features right across in terms of women. Uh, Billie Jean King, who was a very, very formidable tennis player, made the point that her generation was a generation that broke through and brought women to the table. And she was saying the challenge for the next generation of women is they, they ensure that the voice becomes stronger, the responsibility becomes more, and the delivery becomes uh, something that women can be proud of. So that the next generation of women, when they come forward, will, will be going into a better space. So I think that's the task of not just the caucus, but of us all, that this caucus will open up, uh, create the responsibility, create a better place so that in five or ten years' time, if there's an hour inquiry by the Assembly Executive Review Committee, then they can look back and say that the origins of that piece of work was good, it was necessary and it was required, and, and more importantly, that it was delivered. And I call Mr. Sean Roger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm delighted to acknowledge International Women's Day and speak on this particular motion today. And you know, when we look back over history, and the member opposite talked about the suffragettes, you know, and pe only for people like Emily, Emily Pankhurst, the movement she had to give women the vote, how many of us would be here today? We think of women like Florence Nightingale, the Lady of the Lamp, Lady with the Lamp, the Queen of um, the Soldier's Friend and so on, you know, the work that she did. And, and maybe another, another nurse um, uh, who was Calamity Jane, who was famous for some of her more adventurous exploits, but spent her life, uh, spent, spent her life uh, uh, tending small, smallpox victims in the dark hills of Dakota. And then we take somebody like Mother Teresa, and just a little, a little, a little quote here from Mother Teresa, who, had, who, who, was, who was in among the poor all her life, and she said, not all of us can do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. And maybe that's a model maybe we, can, we can take today. References have been made already to the, to, the, to the work of the ARC and the various visits and so on, and in, in terms of women in politics, and I suppose, uh, the key message for me here in terms of whether it's assembly or local government is that we need to be a lot more family friendly, not just for the women, but for the men as well. And particularly speaking with the rural cap on, you know, people like uh, Karen here, or, or, or our First Minister, Arlene Foster from, from Fermanagh, that needs to, be taken, it needs to be taken into consideration. You know, also, in, the, in this year of commemorations, I think we have to acknowledge the role women played in that as well. And we move into think of in Ireland in terms of Ireland's presence of the great work of, of, of Mary Robinson and particularly of Mary McAleese. And could anybody else have done it other than Mary McAleese and Queen Elizabeth when Queen Elizabeth came to Ireland? I don't think so. And the, contribute, the major contribution they have made to, to building bridges on this land. And I think also on a day like this, and the member opposite there spoke about it as well, we have to think of women who are suffering today. The women in, that are suffering in Nigeria, kidnapped by the Boko Haram. The women in the refugee camps, whether in Syria or whether in Cali or wherever. And we think also of the women who are suffering here today as well. Women who have lost a partner or children either in the conflict or in other horrific events. I think particularly of a young, a young wife, a young a constituent of mine, who buried her husband last week after a result of a road traffic accident, is trying to pick up pieces with four young children. And I suppose uh, Katrina brought about, you know, where would any of us be without our mothers? And my mother is long deceased, but a, a great woman, a great country woman. But then, you know, on a lighter note, um, my wife and four daughters, so we could say of nearly International Women's Day is every day in our, our house for, for, for my son and myself. And, um, and I think just, just finally, I would want to acknowledge the great work of women, whether mothers 
or people who have dedicated to the single life, whether in politics or just ac across the world. And, and I wish the Women's Caucus every, every success because I think as many of these, most of these women will, be, will come back to this assembly in the next mandate and I look forward to helping what I can as a man to, to take, take their, their case on further. Thank you. Okay, does that mean you're going to do what you're told? <laughs> I call Miss Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and happy International Women's Day to everyone, to both the women and the men, because um, I don't think anyone in this chamber would be here without a woman, and that's their mothers. Um, Mr. Speaker, I will join others in thanking you for your commitment in progressing uh, gender equality within this assembly. Um, I actually feel this will be your legacy. Um, I, I know as a member of coming up to two years now on the day of the election, that um, your support of me, particularly as an independent female within this assembly, has been really greatly received. Um, you stood up last year and you declared yourself a feminist, so Mr. Speaker, I think you've earned that. Um, and I, I do hope your successor, maybe that will be a female, will uh, continue to build on that wall so that we can keep reaching uh, the gla that glass ceiling that we, that we need to keep breaking time and time again. Um, I want to pay tribute to all my female MLAs. Um, it was a really wonderful man that got me here but I think my learning experience in, in these past two years really was guided by the women in this chamber. You know, it, it can be quite difficult being an independent in this corner, and a female independent at that. However, I've, I've looked to the strength of other women and see how they've conducted themselves within this chamber from all sides of the House, and I do appreciate their guidance. So I, I do want to thank you all for being there. As I said, um, I will be an MLA two years on, uh, on the day of the election. And it's, it has been a great year, 2016. I hope it will be a better one, but we'll see in May. Um, 2016 saw the first female First Minister in Northern Ireland, and I'm kind of glad she's not here because I must admit uh, Arlene Foster is someone that I've always admired, um, and I'd be quite embarrassed saying this if she was in the room. Um, and I admire her, Mr. Speaker, because she's, she's a really good politician. She's not just a good female politician, but genuinely she's a good politician. And I think that's how women need to progress, that we're not set aside because we're women. We're not good at things because we're women, but we're good at things just generally. Um, I have never seen myself um, as being any less capable simply for being female. If others do, well, quite frankly, that's their problem and not mine. Um, and I hope that you know, that's how other younger women will, will see this assembly today, will see me. Um, if, if I uh, can leave this um, chamber uh, today, and the only message that I give out is that we as women will be good role models for other women coming forward. Yeah, please go ahead. I understand the member has been nominated as Woman of the Year in her constituency, and just, I'd just like to congratulate. I know you won't be with us tonight for the launch of the Women's Caucus, but I'd just like to take this opportunity to congratulate you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Um, and also, I want to pay a tribute to Katrina Rian. Um, the Women's Caucus that was, uh, had our first meeting yesterday. Um, I shouldn't really be on it, if I'm quite honest, because I'm an independent member. It was designated by De Hunt. Um, but Katrina Rianne actually went out of her way to ensure that I, d uh, that I did that. And we had a discussion about what the politics of, of that was. And I actually am quite ashamed to say that I actually put the politics ahead of the generosity that she offered me as a woman. So I am quite happy to put on record now that, uh, that Sinn Féin gave up a seat so that I could be on that, because we, they saw the value of me being on that, as, uh, on that group. Um, for my constituency and for other women. And I, I do think that's important. I do think that's why uh, women generally um, have such a good input to politics here, because we can set aside our differences and we can work together and simply get things done. Um, today is International Women's Day. Mr. Speaker, you have made a week of events, and you know, I, th I think it's really a fantastic uh, week of opportunities. Um, but I'm going to declare 2016 as the year as women, uh, for women, particularly in Northern Ireland, because I think we deserve it. And I think it's a good message that we need to send out both women and men. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I call Ms. Sandra Overend to conclude and wind on the debate. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And as Vice Chairperson of the Speaker's Reference Group, on gender sensitive assembly and as an Ulster Unis MLA I very much welcome the opportunity to, to conclude on this debate this afternoon, pertinent as it is on International Women's Day and I will add my uh, voice to all the others 
uh, wishing everyone in the chamber and further afield a happy International Women's Day. It is clear that women have uh, pushed through the sticky door or the glass ceiling or, or whatever metaphor you wish to use before and will continue to do so. Um, but all too often not enough managed to follow the, pion the pioneers through. And I've said in previous discussions uh, like this, conditions do need to be set up so that women are given the same chance in politics as men, uh, as in the STEM sector in business, on boards, and so on. And this assistance is gained through ensuring that women are given the right support uh, to allow them to succeed. Um, at, at this stage, um, I just want to go through some of the, the issues that, that all the contributors have made this, this afternoon, this morning, um, because everyone has raised really good points uh, this morning. And um, I congratulate Paula, who said that this assembly has empowered her. And um, many of us have, have done things we never thought that we could do uh, in our term as assembly, assembly members. And I'm glad that uh, this assembly has empowered her and so many uh, women that I, I look around as well. And men, of course, it has empowered uh, men and women, but um, we, we, we really do want to unlock the potential of women. And uh, there's, there's a lot to be said of finding that balance of men and women uh, in the assembly and in so many places in, in society. Um, uh, Katrina Rowan mentioned that her highlight of, the, of her work uh, in this area was the trip to Sweden. And indeed, that was just like going back to university um, for, for a lot of us. And by times of change, whenever you can uh, use your camera phone to take photographs of the notes that were up in front of us, rather than having to scribble everything down. And uh, um, it, was, it, was a great, um, it was a great opportunity, and, and I agree with her sentiments in that. Um, uh, Mr. Rand mentioned that uh, we are supported by men within our, par within our parties, and I agree this is important too, and indeed I wouldn't be standing here without the support of all the men within the Ulster Unionist Party who encouraged me to stand uh, in, in Mid-Ulster, and I thank them for that. Uh, continual encouragement, I must say. <laughs> um, uh, I refer to, to Mr. Trevor Lunn, he said um, that if we set an example, others will follow. And I think that's a, a, a very, uh, very um, a good point to make. And um, he mentioned also that behind the old saying that maybe we shouldn't say anymore, that behind every man is a good woman, that um, is also very much the case. And at this stage, behind every woman in this assembly, there is a, is a great team of support behind us, whether it's a husband, a mother, a grandmother. Um, we have. We need that support behind us so that we can spend the long hours in this place and dedicate uh, much of our time to this job. And I'd like to place on record uh, my thanks to my support mechanism uh, at home in Mid Ulster. Um, um, Emma Pengali um, talked about the global threat to female liberty. Certainly issues of compassion and something that uh, maybe women are, are more inclined uh, to think about, um, but certainly it is something that we all uh, should consider, men or women, and I thank Ms. Pengelly for highlight, highlighting this issue and join her in supporting that. Um, uh, Raymond McCartney mentioned the, the focus on the events this week, and uh, again I add my thanks and recognition to women who have served in previous assemblies in this place, and I think of our own Ulster Unionist members who I'm not sure if they're attending the, the get-together tomorrow, but I think of Joan Carson and Pauline Armitage. And I add my thanks to previous uh, female MLAs in this place. Uh, Sean Rogers mentioned the... I uh, referred to many female role models, from Florence Nightingale to the amazing Calamity Jane. Um, and I also like to, to add a, and recognise, I'm sure many will agree with me, another role model uh, for many of us, here in Northern Ireland, and that's Her Royal Highness uh, Queen Elizabeth, who has reigned over uh, the United Kingdom for over 60 years. That's such an amazing accomplishment, and I'm, I'm sure others will agree with that. Um, I thank Claire Sugden for her contribution to the, the, the debate this afternoon, and uh, reminded us that we, we all wouldn't be here with, without a woman, and that's, that's our mother, um, whether we're men or women. And uh, uh, I congratulate her on her, her two years as assembly member here and certainly feel that 
uh, she has made a difference to uh, in, in many things that she has done. So I'd like to echo the comments of all other speakers and, and congr congratulate the Speaker of the House on taking the initiative to proceed with all his work uh, in this area. I acknowledge the work of the Assembly Executive and Review Committee and the Secretariat staff who support the committee, supported the committee on their inquiry on women in politics and the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, as uh, many members of this afternoon said, Paula Bradley, Katrina Ruan and indeed Trevor Lund highlighted the work of the whole ERC committee and it's, it's been crucial in examining this issue and uh, Trevor recommended the, the recommendations of that report and I'm, I'm sure uh, that this is something that, that can be continued and pursued. The work of Politics Plus has been excellent uh, as they have been seeking to strengthen the role of women in political and public life through various programs, the Women in Politics Programme, Women in Public Life Programme, Experts in Residence Programme and the Young Female Leaders Academy. Politics Plus has also had a crucial role in supporting the establishment of the Speaker's Reference Group on a Gender Sensitive Assembly and the Northern Ireland Assembly Women's Caucus. As Vice Chairperson of the Speaker's Reference Group on Gender Sensitive Assembly, I'd also like to um, acknowledge and thank uh, the Chairperson Karen McEvitt for all her work uh, as Chairperson of that group and for proposing this afternoon's motion. Um, and I'd like to also thank all the members of the group both men and women, importantly, to develop uh, a, dra a draft gender-sensitive action plan and their support for the establishment of the Northern Ireland Assembly Women's Caucus. The ERC committee concluded that underrepresentation of women in politics in Northern Ireland is a serious issue which must be addressed as a matter of urgency. They recommended that the Assembly should establish a working group on a gender-sensitive Assembly which should be made up of equal members of male and female. And this group was established on the 10th of February this year and its membership comprises of both men and women MLAs. Numerous submissions to the ERC committee called for the establishment of a women's parliamentary caucus as an example of good practice in supporting existing female politicians and encouraging aspiring female politicians to enter politics. As a result, the committee recommended that the Assembly should facilitate the creation of a women's caucus. With the support of Politics Plus, the Speaker's Reference Group have worked to establish the Northern Ireland Assembly's Women's Caucus, which will be officially launched this evening. It had its first meeting yesterday. And uh, as the proposer said, the vision of the caucus is to have a united women's assembly caucus working together, irrespective of political party affiliation, to ensure equality for all, to provide an opportunity for women to exchange and ensure there is cross-party collaboration on ideas, to form collective platforms on particular policies and actions, and to support one another on issues and areas of common concern. <coughs> The chairperson of the group, uh, Ms McEvitt, talked this earlier about the proposed objectives of the caucus in proposing uh, today's motion. <laughs> Mr Speaker, Kimberly Kyle Mayer stated in her paper entitled Women Legislators in Northern Ireland, Gender and Politics in the New Legislative Assembly, that women legislators may not be able to influence institutional norms, policy priorities <laughs> or policy outputs in the absence of a, cri of a critical mass of women over 30 per cent. Yet even in the absence of a critical mass of women, the efforts of women legislators to have effect on women may be advanced by establishing a women's legislative caucus. According to the Interparliamentary Union 2013, women's parliamentary caucuses are mechanisms that have been created within the parliaments of many countries to strengthen cooperation among women engaged in political life. Such caucuses can bring women parliamentarians together across par party lines in effective alliances around a common goal. Guidelines for women's caucuses states, women's caucuses help up to build the capacity of women parliamentarians, organizing and providing support and training to make them better members. And according to research conducted by the Interparliamentary Union, the main challenge facing newly elected women is coming to grips with how male dominated the system is and figuring out the Parliament's written and unwritten rules and procedures. Um, so therefore, while this Northern Ireland Assembly currently has 23 women and equates, equates to 20% of members overall, I'm particularly pleased that we have created a Women's Caucus. 
Our numbers in this assembly may be small, but we are no less a force, in, a force to be reckoned with. We have achieved much in our numbers and have much to be proud of. So it's up to women uh, to put their shoulders to the door and to give it a hard shove, but indeed it is up to assembly members here that we hold that door open and encourage many others to come through. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. And it gives me the greatest possible pleasure to say <laughs> that the ayes have it. I don't know whether anybody funked the challenge or not. So the next item of